So just to introduce myself again, I'm Steve Shaw. Uh, I'm responsible for heading up the product team over on the RPA side of the world. I have a counterpart who helps me with the AI, and uh, uh, together we are Steve Squared. So uh, let's uh, jump into this. This is my second tech field day. One of the things I love about Tech Field Day is that I have an audience that keeps me honest. So by all means, ask the questions that keep me honest. Uh, and if uh, you want to call nonsense on something, by all means do so. And I recall the offer for having a scheduled time when to call uh, nonsense on me. You don't have to do it, uh, but I'm simply making it an option. So with that, uh, let's dive into this. We've got a lot of stuff to do and we've got uh, slightly less time than scheduled to do it. So earlier, you saw the slide from Abhijit that outlined what our users are, are trying to do. What are they thinking about? What's driving them? What's motivating them? As we look forward and say, what do we need to think about over the course of the next year? What are the specific things we need to solve for them? So same point of view in terms of the personas that we're trying to address, but now we want to talk about the actual specific things that we want to address for them. So in that vein, we've got three things that we want to address. Number one is, for those business users, this is about ease of use and ease of adoption. You know, one of the things that comes up, and, and this is sometimes a little tricky to appreciate if you're using technology day in and day out, you know, you know command lines don't scare you. If your day in and day out is Excel and writing functions, suddenly this prospect of being told, you're gonna to build a bot is actually a very overwhelming one. And so the starting point of just being able to say, this is as easy as everything that you're used to using. Clean web interfaces, you know, drag and drop, all of those things. If you can think logically and you can write a function, you could probably build a bot. And so that becomes a big piece of this. How do you make this whole process as easy as possible? And while we primarily talk about business users, the thing I wanna highlight here is that in an IT context, oftentimes this comes up as something where you've got an IT user who they've gone through certifications, they're not software engineers. So when we've gone and asked them and said, go learn Python because here's an API and here's how you're gonna configure your Cisco switch, it's, it's all gonna be through API and it's gonna be awesome. And you sometimes get glazed eyes over that. I think we've all seen that at some point, we sometimes maybe have felt that. When that happens, being able to go and give somebody in that position a tool to say, here's something that lets you just lay out the logical flow of what you're trying to achieve from a DevOps perspective, and it's a tool that makes the whole process easier to record and replay. And this is especially handy when you've got that piece of legacy infrastructure in there that's just not going away anytime soon. You know, you've got a serial port multiplexer with modems hanging off of it. It ain't getting an API. That's just how it's going to be. So how do we go and automate something like that? That's what we're thinking about here. The IT side of this is really an operations problem. In an ideal world, you've got more and more people adopting bots. And suddenly, the scope of adoption changes the scale that you're thinking about IT. So suddenly, you're going from thinking about maybe hundreds of users or a few thousand users to potentially tens of thousands of users. And when you suddenly have thousands of users going off and building bots, they're, they're doing things like building a bot, forgetting it's there, and then just kind of letting it go off to the side, which I mean, the question came up earlier. How do you manage that? How do you go and apply governance to it? How do you apply security policies to it? How do you just think about that problem? And what are the tools you need for being able to handle that? Handling bots at scale and being able to apply that governance in a strict manner becomes a big part of it. And then just thinking about the cost side of it, because there is a cost side of this. You want to be able to go and operate this without having a linear IT cost going up because you have more and more bots being added to the system. The last group of users are developers, and they're a relatively recent add to this whole conversation. I, I, I love developers, a former developer here, you know, uh, but no, they took away my check-in bit for a reason. They also took away root for a reason, so take that for what it's worth. Developers are coming into RPA primarily from the business process automation space. And a bunch of Java, smart guys, all good stuff. You have all of these uh, teams of people who want to participate in helping this automation effort. They want to be a part of this conversation. What are the tools we want to give them to be able to go and contribute? 
And as part of giving them tools, what are the tools that we don't just count for them, but think about the data scientists who maybe aren't C Sharp or Java programmers. They're just little, they want to write a couple of small <coughs> Python scripts without worrying about integration with a half a dozen things. What do we do for them? So it's not just, you know, you're going from business users who want something simple to serious developers who want really rich, complex capabilities. You want a spectrum of what's in between and what are the tools we can provide for them. So let's dive into first those business users. Uh, and again, I use business users in the generic. I, I think it's somebody here qualified, didn't use the qualification of business users earlier. They just said users. I think you did. Yeah, it's probably you. Uh, you know, I don't trust anyone who says I spy Wi-Fi on their laptop, so mm -hmm. you shouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> so, you uh, know, I think the users in the broad generic se uh, sense applies, right? Uh, what do we do for all of our users? And so the first thing we want to really look at is what is that ease of use claim that we're making? Uh, making something easy to use doesn't just mean having a GUI. We all know that. You can make GUIs hard to use, too. So really thinking through and actually applying a lot of design first philosophies into this matters a great deal. So simple things, for example, uh, being able to go and have that flow chart view because a lot of times somebody who's trying to put together a simple process, I need to take stuff from this Excel spreadsheet. You know, I've got a list of all of the licenses that I've done for all of the you know, software I bought from this vendor. And I need to go and I need to plug this into ServiceNow because that's how we're tracking it. So I need to take some legacy file, pump it into there, and I don't want to do it by hand. And it's not perfectly clean. So I want to build a bot that can help me. Being able to just go and say, you know, for each row in an Excel spreadsheet and not have to worry about what an API call looks like without having to worry about how do you start Excel, how do you integrate with Excel. You just want to be able to say that Excel file, every row in it, go do this, grab this column, and then shove it into that field in ServiceNow. That's all I want to worry about. That's the level of flow charting we're doing here. And that is enough to actually build a functional bot. So from there, we want to be able to go and not just look at this from a flow chart point of view, because that's a great way to start, but sometimes you want to look at it as a series of lines of code. So the lines of code don't look like traditional lines of code. If you're familiar with you know, Python, Java, any of the usual suspects in programming languages, uh, yesterday we had a great discussion about awk, for those of you who are old enough to remember what awk is. Uh, we had too many nods in here, so <laughs> I, I feel my, my, my fellow awk programmers. Uh, being able to go sometimes and just look at the, the lines that describe what it is we're doing so that you get a lot of density on the screen, right? That's sometimes helpful, and being able to see either or helps. So the internal representation of a bot is done such that you can actually see either or, and sometimes if you want to see both, you can see both. So now if you have pair programming going on, you could actually have somebody who understands, say, a business process who lives in the world of SAP and sitting next to somebody who comes from a land of code, and the two of them can have this two different views of the exact same thing so that they can communicate with one another. Uh, we are rolling this whole thing out as a native cloud piece. That to me seems shocking uh, if you're you know, right now using all the usual uh, suspects in terms of Google services and so on. But if you think about this for a lot of enterprises, the vast majority of applications still live on premise. And so RPA started on premise. Now it's moving towards a SaaS model but it's got to still be able to span that, that, that line between the two. Now, anyone who deals in the land of networking, and I think a handful of, here, of you do do that, that span of on-premise versus what's happening in the SaaS universe is still a very real one, and it's something that's going to take a while to resolve. So being able to span those two sides becomes a big part of how we're thinking about the problem and making sure that we make that as seamless as possible. That drag and drop that we talked about earlier, I don't want to have to type this stuff in because it could easily turn into very hairy code. I don't want syntax rules defining my world. If the person can generate a syntax error, that's broken. So in a drag and drop universe, I drag over and say for each row of Excel, it pops up a dialog box on the right that says, great, which Excel spreadsheet are you talking about and which rows did you want to go? First 10 rows, every row, what? So just having all the parameters spread out there means that you don't generate syntax errors. You don't have the missing semicolon that's going to break 
you know, your thought process and you're spending hours debugging something silly. I have a question. Please. Um, I like what you're saying. Uh, I saw on your website that you have a lot of free online courses and you have consultancy services. Mm -hmm. So I was, I was wondering, like, how much time do you need to invest to uh, work with that tool? Uh, it's a great question. Uh, I think from an time investment, what we find is that you can build your first functional bot within the first hour. So, for example, at, at our events that we host, we do a build a bot. A build a bot is a one hour session. We walk you through building your first bot so that you just get comfortable with the ideas and the concepts. Uh, and we see a lot of broad, a broad set of people coming into it. So for instance, uh, I met once a hospital director who did a build a bot session just so she could prove that everyone on her team could do it. Uh, definitely not a programmer, right? Um, one hour clearly isn't enough to make you an expert. But now you're looking at saying, okay, once I can build a couple of simple bots, uh, if I want to expand that and be able to build uh, a rich set of bots, that might be a few hours in order to go and build error resilient bots so that when an application changes underneath it, it can detect that and handle that error. Uh, that might be closer to a few days. What you're not getting at is you're not reaching a four year degree in order to do this. And so you've really shrunk the time. Uh, generally, somebody who's gone through this, they've spent a few weeks, they're building pretty resilient bots. Uh, and somebody who's gone through our coursework, which doesn't take that long in, the, in, in calendar time, uh, it's not like getting a CCIE or something like that. Uh, being able to go and do that means zero to hero in about two weeks. Right. And uh, does that, like, uh, does that, um, the technical competencies, like what kind of level does that matter? Um, if you're a business user? Yeah, it, it obviously helps if you're a power user because yeah. you at least understand what the applications are and you know that where they live and just how to use them. Mm. Uh, the more fluent you are with the applications you use, the better your bots are going to be. Uh, and the more familiar you're going to be with things like, oh yeah, every time they drive an upgrade, the screen changes. I need to think about that. Mm. Um, if you are not a power user, you're, you're sticking with basic applications. Uh, being able to just use the recorder that was described earlier, I want to record a set of actions, take this, plug it in there, and keep doing it. That doesn't require any, you know, you can be a very basic user and get that through. Uh, so the various, you can do varying levels of that expertise and be able to pull that off and still write uh, useful bots. Can I ask a question Please. as well? Um, Obviously, this is great. First of all, an easy interface to be uh, to being available is a great thing anyway. Uh, and you quoted an example of integrating with, say, Excel or Salesforce and those kind of um, task based or services. But that brings me to a question that Keith Townsend, who is watching with interest, has asked that. Hi, Pete. <laughs> um, that, you know, how does this system integrate with other ecosystem um, environments like VDI environment or security products, what is the product doing to integrate with those things? Because mm -hmm. integration is important when you're building such an interface. Absolutely. Bots. So it needs to be integrated with all kinds of different external systems. So how do you do that? So let's start with VDI first. Uh, and, and I'll caution my, my last tech field day, I was wearing a Citrix badge. So, and I'm, I apologize to anyone who, who takes offense to that. Um, the, in the VDI universe, you can be on one of two sides of this conversation. You can be on the client side of this where you've got receiver and you're accessing the world through the receiver interface. If you're accessing the world through the receiver interface, then you're using the AI sense piece that we were talking about earlier, where we're actually taking the bitmap that the Citrix environment is feeding us. We're actually using machine learning to figure out what the screen looks like. We're able to go and apply a lot of the same controls that we have for a local application in that environment, and it works fine. Uh, you can be on the other side of that equation where you're actually running inside of the VDI and you're seeing it coming out the, the other side. And that means that from the other side, you have a virtual desktop. You don't have a physical screen that you're connected to. Uh, in that environment, you're able to go and get uh, the same level of visibility into all of the controls that exist in the underlying environment, so you can automate it that way as well. 
Uh, VDI was one example. There was a second example in that. Security. Security. So, uh, security products or? or security in general, but they, you know, there could be any product in space. So, I want to ask Pete to hang tight because I'm going to come to security explicitly a little bit later and we'll talk about that a little more thoroughly because uh, in most cases, you're seeing bots increasingly touch sensitive data, a lot of PII, things like that, uh, audit control suddenly matter. Uh, being able to go and apply our back, uh, you know, if a bot is logging in to a sensitive application on your behalf, who sees the password and where does that password get stored? These are all important things. So let's actually do that in a structured form, and we're going to come back to that in about 30 minutes. But but I was just wondering that if from an interface point of view, obviously those mm -hmm. issues are also. We'll wait for those. Right. Say, for example, if a security product needs to be integrated in the sense that you know an alert was generated, and uh, a bot needs to take certain actions, uh, and we will wait for the security concerns about that. But you know, the antivirus any message pops up. Exactly. Yeah. Are there any products already integrated that take certain actions without you having to take that action manually? So that that's where the exception handling comes in, right? Because those kinds of exceptions do occur. Uh, in an exception, exception handling case, uh, being able to say, hey, uh, the focus of my screen got stolen away, I need to get, I need maybe some human help in this because I'm not expecting that pop up to show up. If antivirus pops up and is asking me to do something, there could actually be a risk here that we don't, we want to stop the automation at that point. So all of the tools that we give in terms of, you know, hey, what's the bot equivalent of a try catch? Uh, how do you go and deal with suddenly not finding the control that you expected to see on the focused window and so on? Those are things that are baked into the language and the exception handling is there. So if something happens and you're, it's out of scope, you can at least bring a human into the loop to deal with it. Uh, if you're dealing with bots that are running, say, on the desktop, it's helping out a person, then it might just pause and say, hey, something happened, can you take an action for me? Click, let me know when you're good, good and it continues. In the case of a fully automated environment where it's running off on some back-end infrastructure and, and not to be seen, uh, that might require the system to pause that process and wait for a human to get plugged in. Thank you. Yeah. Awesome. So let's, I think we've talked about the rest of those. What about that first-time user? Uh, we wanted to go and provide some of the, the turnkey stuff so that you can easily build a bot for the first time, give some guidance. And so if you talk about that first-time training experience, uh, the simple process of being able to get the hello world equivalent through your first login is helpful. Uh, and so that becomes a big part of it. So let's get a little geeky for a minute. Uh, what's actually running and where is it running? So when you actually say, I want to fire off a bot, oh, that bot is actually, uh, it's stored as an internal language that we have. Uh, from a file format perspective, in our older versions, it was an XML file. New file formats, we're using some JSON. The, the actual syntax doesn't matter that much because the normal users don't see this. This is not something that uh, an administrator has to deal with. You can just treat that as a blob of data. It's, it's a program. That gets sent out to what's called a bot runner. That bot runner is put on the host that actually needs to run the automation. Now remember that the automation is going to be where the application is. So for instance, if you're trying to automate a uh, 3270 application that's talking to a Salesforce application, right? Then you're going to need the 3270 client and you're going to need a browser that has access or is allowed access to Salesforce if you have policy controls on how that works. So you want to be specific about where that runs. So there are controls in place for how you direct that traffic. Once it goes there, you have a common runner foundation. All this is is a runtime engine takes care of uh, seeing that the bot is coming in. When a bot comes in, it's got all the tools it needs for being able to execute the bot. We actually make this a pretty generic framework so that it's able to execute every conceivable type of bots, including commands that it may not be defined at the point that we deploy it. So we want some flexibility into that. We give it a set of libraries. So if you think about sort of where microservices are going right now and the use of sidecars in lieu of underlying platforms. So rather than say, I want a 
piece of network here up front, I'm going to instead take a sidecar service that's going to handle my service API calls. That same kind of thinking is here. So you end up with a library that hangs off the side, and now as bots come in, they're able to go and access that library, and that's where it has common tools for things like, how do I message another bot? How do I go and get an update from the central management stack? Uh, how do I go and send my results back? Uh, if there's more data that I need to pull from somewhere, how do I communicate? All of that shared stuff goes there. There's an SDK that's coming out a little bit later this year that'll let you go and have third-party components that can plug into that same framework. So now you can have, say, another ISV that you know Salesforce makes their own bot that plugs into this infrastructure. They've got an SDK for being able to do that. Nice, pretty set of APIs that will provide them. In a context like that, that SDK is not meant for the business user, obviously. That, that, that SDK is meant for somebody who is a you know, Java programmer, C Sharp programmer, et cetera. That, that's meant for them. The actions that are at the top refer back to the actions that you saw on the left side of the screen in the GUI screenshot earlier. So every command ends up taking a blob of action, and each of those are their own self-contained unit of program. So what ends up happening is the bot will go and take all of the information it needs. It knows all the commands it needs. It knows all the components it needs at the server piece, puts them together, sends that assembly over to the other side. The other side will go and run it on the runtime engine and use the common action tools for being able to go and execute that. That way, as commands change over time, that way, as tooling changes over time, updates happen, a security rev comes out, whatever it happens to be, you can now pick up those changes without necessarily having to reinstall a bunch of clients. Uh, every time you have to roll out a client, massive cost, right? Because now you're talking about potentially, uh, in one case that uh, I have the privilege of working with, they've got around 4,000 of these hosts that are configured. So when you roll out a new client to 4,000 hosts, there's a lead time. You need to go get the desktop team involved. They need help, blah, 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 all the stuff that usually goes into packaging an MSI that has to get done. This removes a lot of that need for having to do frequent updates. So now you want a new command, a new command can come in and can get pushed to the runtime engine. The runtime engine is able to deploy it. Uh, and there's controls in place in the central management stack for what gets rolled out to where under what rules. So as an administrator, you still have controls over that. You don't let third party stuff run willy nilly on here. There's a trust relationship between the platform and the server stack, so the management stack. So you can't get third party pieces of code running on here either. Uh, it needs to get signs sent from the server, otherwise it's not trusted. So I have a question for you. Please. So I was looking at the, the, the bot store that you guys have. So for example, right now those bots are already done. With the SDK, would you be able to use SDK to edit those existing bots? The existing bots that are written for our older platform, the 11.x platform, those are going to require updates before they'll run on this new platform. Uh, the old platform wasn't quite as efficient. It was all one big monolithic blob, which uh, resulted in, it was, it was a powerful tool, but it required updates that uh, had a high operational cost. Uh, this is a little more flexible. A lot of those tools are now getting updated as we speak, so uh, we'll be talking more about that on the last half hour section. Any other questions about the bot architecture, what goes into it? I'm still struggling a little bit to understand. So you've got actions here. You define Excel, email, you common things. Mm -hmm. The next Slack comes along, and you haven't had time to engineer those actions. How do you capture the actions um, <laughs> before you've built that into your tool? Two possible ways. Uh, in the case of a SaaS application with an API, there's a common RESTful set of calls that you can make, so either SOAP or REST, that we have an action that's ready to go for that. So if you've got you know, an internal API, you've got a new application that doesn't have a, a, a plugin yet, you can always use the RESTful APIs. What if it's something more legacy that doesn't have an API? Which, yeah, that's the... Uh, I think I, sh I shared with a few of you earlier that I recently ran across a Power Builder application. Power Builder hasn't been made since 1995, right? Uh, 
in that circumstance, the recorder is actually really good at being able to deal with those legacy frameworks. So whenever we see a legacy application, uh, that is a common interface we can use for being able to automate something. And you don't do that by adding a new command block for it. Instead, you just use the recorder and let it capture the necessary clicks and keyboard presses uh, and, and uh, focus points in order to go and replay a, an action against that application. Step one is to try and, you want to use an API, then you want to try and use a framework, but then fall back to screen scrape. Uh, uh, the, so the way that the recorder works is that it is actually, it varies based on the, the framework it's talking to. So if you're talking about, say, a traditional Windows application, what we're able to do is we're able to hook inside of Windows and actually see the logical layout of a window. So we're not looking at a bitmap of it. What we're doing is we're seeing, ah, I see this is a text field. I see this is a button. This button, you know, uh, here's a button, here's a text field, here's a radio box, and so on. So when somebody clicks on one of those, I can see that event and track it back. So if those radio boxes move a little bit or something like that, it doesn't matter. I have an object name I can engage with. Uh, in the case of uh, web-based applications, we look at the DOM tree, right? And that allows us to go and reliably replay in that environment. Uh, in the case of, you know, Java frameworks, we have a little plugin that goes and works with the Java framework uh, because we need, you know, Java doesn't expose the objects on its window to the underlying Windows operating system. So we need to ask Java for its view of the object play and, and see what's inside of there. All in all, there's about 11 or 12 different frameworks we support. Uh, and we, we're constantly adding new ones. So whenever we run across a new one, a legacy one, homegrown stuff, uh, we're able to go and still uh, add plugins or elements to that. Uh, a lot of that recorder, a lot of that capability of being able to cope with the frameworks and deal with those different frameworks all come from that recorder technology. All right. And that's also where we, we identify, oh, this is receiver uh, for Citrix treat that as a bitmap, go, go pull an AI sense and let it figure out what the objects are and then I'm gonna take that object list and replay against that. Yeah, yeah, screen scrape is like, it's a worst case situation, uh, but you can always use that. Uh, obviously when you screen scrape and you look at the world as a bitmap, your reliability may not be as sharp, it's definitely a lot slower. Uh, if you're able to go and understand what the underlying object play looks like, it screams forward and it can uh, replay often faster than a human can. And sometimes you're actually adding delays in there because there's think time for the application. So for instance, um, I see this that pops up with like login screens on certain SaaS applications. If you go and start typing too fast, the JavaScript eventer that's doing on key press is sitting there and making all these Ajax calls on the back end. Uh, Ajax, that's how old I am making all these API calls on the back end that's, that's pulling up all this data to auto fill in stuff and you know, it, it can't keep up with how fast you're eventing. So you insert artificial delays in there. Uh, that kind of stuff, the software is generally really good at using heuristics for saying, oh yeah, you know, uh, I see that this is a web thing, I'm only gonna replay this fast versus at maximum speed. So when it can do things locally, it may do things a little bit faster. When it sees other frameworks, it may default to using a slightly slower rate. So as, as you bring up the uh, speed of interaction and delays, it uh, triggers on uh, Keith Townsend's other earlier question, mm -hmm. which is that when you take the human being out of, out of the equation, then you're allowing things to happen very fast. What do you have in the way of circuit breakers that avo avoid that leading to an overload on the back end systems? Yeah, it, it's, it's all a bunch of heuristics for that because, you know, you would think it's infinitely fast, but it's not. Apps have think time. Uh, I do something on an app, it needs to go do something and it comes back to you. So if you think about the question about what is the load of a bot on a host, right, from earlier, the, the load on, a, on an environment is still gonna be, and this is not a perfect number, but it's 90% the original apps, right? If you're running Oracle EBS in the Java stuff because that's the release from 2003 that you haven't gotten off of, Right, and uh, it terrifies me sometimes that I still see stuff like that out there. Then again, we have Power Builder out there. In those environments, 
that is going to be your slow thing. The bot is not going to be the big chunk of CPU or memory that's going to get eaten up. It's the fact that you're still running Oracle EBS client there and it's a fat application that wasn't meant to run very quickly. Uh, they were expecting a human on the other side. They weren't expecting a bot to be injecting data into it. Um, is at some point during the presentation, because I don't know the deep dive on the program itself, are we going to discuss um, the infrastructure required to run all of this? Because I think people yeah. will be interested to know how much of what they need to implement to have such an infrastructure. Uh, so I don't have a, an exact infrastructure slide, so let's just touch on that real quick right now. Um, the way that this is broken up is there are three parts of it. There's the uh, control room, there's the bot runner, and there's the bot creator. Uh, in our current you know, shipping version, the 11.x series, the, those were three separate pieces. In our new universe, everything for bot creator has now been integrated into the control room. That is your central management stack. Uh, so, you know, for those of you coming from uh, more traditional infrastructure backgrounds, Every new infrastructure product has a new management stack that has all of your analytics and it has all of your, you know, hey, here's where we shoved in AI and here's where we put in the business intelligence and the, the here's how we control things. Um, same basic idea with the control room. That's what control room does. It is the overseer for all of the bots that are out there. Uh, bots don't get to run without control room being involved. Um, for First time use, sometimes that's a little annoying because you're expecting that I want the freedom to just go and write my own bot and not ask anybody's permission. But most enterprise organizations don't want people doing that. They want controls in place because they want to be able to track who's running what bot under what circumstance and what identity. Uh, control room is, uh, uh, it's a full server, right? And so you're looking at something that's going to need uh, 8 to 16 gigs, depending on what you're loading up on it and how, many, how much you're pushing it from an analytics perspective. Uh, it's going to require a pretty healthy CPU for being able to run that because it might be talking to as many as, you know, uh, you, you look at upper bounds on where we see uh, deployments right now, we see tens of thousands of bots rolled out there. And so if you want one server to talk to 10,000 bots, you better have enough cores and enough uh, network connectivity to be able to manage that kind of uh, transaction. From a network perspective, it's not terribly chatty. Uh, it pushes out a bot, the bot goes, does its thing. There are updates that dribble back and then once it's done, it has all the data it needs. The client will go and evaporate the bot or, or you know, if it can cache it, it'll cache it, but that's the end of the transaction. So you don't find, uh, you see little spikes in, in network load that come up. Um, it is a chatty protocol because it's doing things like validating, am I allowed to do what I'm doing right now? Uh, I need to stay authenticated. Uh, and then certain things like you know JWT uh, tends to get kicked in there and they want to be able to go and authenticate and generate new keys on, from a regular basis. Uh, so that's the, that's the control room side. The bot runner side is pretty thin. Um, those who are familiar with our older versions of the product may think, oh, hey, the current bot runner for version 11, you know, it's a one gig download, uh, you know, it uses a fair amount of memory. Please tell me you've made it smaller. And I can say, yes, we've made it smaller because uh, I wanted to run it on my laptop. And there's nothing like a product manager in need to drive an engineering requirement. So uh, that is the... Uh, and uh, the bot runner now is a much smaller piece. It's a th that thin sliver at the bottom, the foundation. Uh, that probably doesn't eat up more than, you know, dozens of, of megs of memory uh, sitting idle. Uh, when it's running, it will vary based on the application that you're trying to automate and how much state you're putting into it. Obviously, if you do things like say, I want to go and slurp, you know, a 500 row Excel spreadsheet into a big matrix that I store in the bot's memory. Well, guess what? You need memory for that, right? Uh, if your bot is pretty straightforward, you're not retaining a lot of state from command to command, then it's not going to require a lot of memory for runtime. Um, the uh, load typically is, is small for a laptop. Uh, you know, right now we've got people who use uh, they like the really small laptops, uh, and so when you were using the really small laptops, you might only have uh, two to four gigs of memory, uh, Windows 10, and your 
still able to run this without a problem in a mobile CPU. Uh, that will run just fine. So the control environment that you're talking about is a certain amount of, amount of CPU and memory, you said. Correct. But are there a high availability of that system? Because yes. that's important. But also, it does it scale out as, say, your infrastructure? The way it's architected is as a series of microservices internally. So uh, every instance of control room is inherently stateless. So there is a database that you need to provide that's running on the back end. Uh, that database can either be Oracle or it can be Microsoft SQL Server. And we will go and horizontally scale out the control rooms and have it all work with the SQL database. Um, both SQL and Oracle, uh, uh, and I'm more familiar with SQL in this circumstance, uh, have tools that have characteristics a little bit like Redis, not entirely like Redis, but enough that I can go and store intermediate state there and access it really fast. Uh, so in that circumstance, that lets me go and let a server take a bullet, go down, and I can let the load balancer shift the load to the other guys. Uh, this also means that as long as I've got a common database instance that's shared globally, so I've got replication happening and I've got the pipes for being able to support something like that, now I can start doing geo-based replication, uh, let the database take care of the state, and I can place control rooms where I've got users, so that I've got locality between the control rooms and wherever the bots are running. Question. Is there a possibility to run small standalone bots directly on users' machines, laptops, VDIs, without the need to run the full blown, full fledged infrastructure around it? Code them directly yeah. on, the, on the endpoint? So, the, uh, being able to run a standalone bot without the control room is something that uh, we're evaluating right now. Uh, I think that's something that uh, we hear requests for, and so we definitely appreciate why people want to do it. Uh, for somebody who wants to just get their hands dirty uh, for the sake of trying it without having to install all of the server infrastructure, we do have a community edition. Uh, the community edition lets you just go log in, you just get the client in that circumstance, we take care of hosting the, the control room, and you're able to build bots, play with it, uh, go through the training stuff and whatnot. Uh, so we see I mean, the, the onboarding rate in the community editions actually, uh, I've, I've had the privilege of running community editions before and I've never seen adoption take up like this. Uh, so definitely exciting uh, in terms of how people are using it. Uh, the, uh, with the new version that we're coming out with and, and community edition will get updated uh, in a few weeks time. The community edition will just have the web-based uh, bot creator, so you don't even need to download anything for creating those first handful of bots. You just need mm -hmm. a browser. Uh, at the point that you say run that, it's going to download this agent. This agent is pretty tiny, as I was mentioning earlier, and you're able to go and run bots in that environment. So perfect for learning. But you know, we are all techies, and we get our hands on a complete product, even if scaled down and do all the work ourselves. So will the community edition have a special community edition that people or techies can play with? I, in turn, even the control is what I'm There's doing. a free trial that's, that's web uh, uh, cloud hosted for you, uh, which will also give you access to the control room. And so that will let you go and see all of the infrastructure side of it without having to set that server up yourself. How long is that trial for coming? It's a typical 30 day kind of thing. I'll live with that for now. Uh, I, I understand that. At, at some point, well, there's a little bit of give and take in this conversation. So Let's do that. Uh, but uh, it is a um, being able to go and download the whole thing. You can download the whole thing. You can install it locally, right? Um, you, you know, getting a beefy enough laptop. So I've got PMs that they don't mind running the whole stack on one laptop, and it does fit. Um, it's just not a way that you would run that in production. So it's enough for you to get a feel for it, especially as an admin who needs to get a feel for it and run it all on one laptop, uh, especially if your laptop tends to be beefy and techies tend to have beefier laptops. Uh, so we do take advantage of that. Uh, so I think I mentioned all of the other inf adjacent infrastructure in passing in that previous bit about what's needed from a database. Uh, if you want horizontal scalability, you're going to need to throw a load balancer in front of it. Uh, any modern load balancer, uh, a NetScaler, an F5, uh, AWS with ELB, all of that stuff will work just fine. Awesome. Oh, were there any other infrastructure questions? Uh, not for now, because okay. I mean, you need to cover your own. 
the slides as well. Well, I'm in marketing. I've got slides for slides. So, uh, so we already talked about recorder, so we can skip that, and we're going to jump over <laughs> to the IT piece. One of the cool things that we got out of this was getting Linux support. Um, so with the new version, you'll be seeing Linux support coming out in the next quarter, and uh, this means that you're able to build bots that are able to run on both Windows and Linux. Now, obviously, if a bot depends on a Windows-based application, you're running it on Windows. But if your bot is, say, you know, it's going to do something straightforward. It wants to go and uh, work with a bunch of SaaS applications uh, and deal with a, you know, uh, a 3270 application. We can take care of that entirely inside of the bot, and you don't need to run that on a dedicated Windows instance anymore. So there's a lot more flexibility in terms of where you can target and run and then give yourself that flexibility. This also means that there's nothing inherent in the bot design itself that goes and pulls it in one direction or another in terms of uh, the host operating system that needs to be used. Uh, we already talked about that. So a quick architectural note here. Uh, as I mentioned in, uh, earlier, everything is a microservice. And so because everything is a microservice, you're able to go and get each of these individual components and access them via API. So all of the communication that happens from uh, our web interface and all of the things that happen from our uh, bot runners uh, all happen through web service calls. And so, and I've got a slide on this a little later, but from a firewall perspective, this means that as long as you can run a proxy and that proxy is able to pass on uh, port 443, you're in good shape, right? Uh, we also do web sockets traffic, so uh, expect the ports for web sockets to need to be open as well. Uh, and then as a result, because it's all web services oriented, this also makes it NAT friendly. So you don't have to worry about uh, control room initiating a connection out to the bot runner. It's always the runner communicating back to control room. So the communication always happens one way. Uh, this also means that if the bots need to run in a secure zone. So take, for example, uh, you know, large organization, they've got multiple security zones, you might want your control room in a security zone that gives it access to a broad range of different applications. But if you have a class of applications that are very high sensitive, secure, you might run that in a, you know, uh, a deep security zone inside of that inner ring. It can still reach out and talk to the control room so long as you've got a firewall policy that allows that control room won't initiate a connection back, so you don't have to worry about functionality in that circumstance. Do you see the, the, the highly secured implement, implementations going that way, that command and control is in a low trust zone being being pushed into a high trust zone? Not that kind of yet, with how but I design it. yeah, no, it, it, so we're not seeing that yet. Okay. Um, but I think as the, the scope of bots gets broader and the use cases broadens up, I see this as kind of an inevitable thing because if you look at enterprises, that's how they are structured. You know, the VDIs are in one place, the apps are in another, and so on, and there's firewalls in between all of this. So you may not want the VDI systems talking to a set of applications directly. You may want them going through a set of proxies first. So those mandates may be in place. When you've got something that uses all the web services calls, you're following a norm everyone's familiar with. So the security you know, teams that have to support this aren't going to be scratching their head. This is not like H323 where it says open up port 0 to 65535, bidirectionally, TCP and UDP, and then it'll work. You don't have to worry about that. Um, sadly, H323 is still around. I don't know why, but it is. Go figure. The, um, um, and then we, uh, I'll talk about work queues in just a little bit. Uh, there's two use cases for bots that I want to call out here because they change the user profile and the environment and infrastructure profile just a little bit. So the example of I have a bot running on my desktop, it's helping me out day to day, that's an attended bot. Uh, so when you're talking to somebody and you say, hey, do you have attended bot use cases? This is what they mean. It's a bot helping a person. So imagine somebody in, say, a call center environment. That call center environment, they've got, you know, four or five different applications open, 
customer calls up, they give an account number, and now you've got to log in to all of these different applications to pull up that customer record for all of that single person. That's where a call center person may put you on hold and you sit for you know, a minute waiting for them to plug in your account number into all of these different things. With an attended bot, it's meant to take care of going and saying, oh, I see this, this account number got typed in. Let me plug it in into these other apps while you're still on the phone with the person. And suddenly, all of your apps pop up simultaneously with the account information. So you don't have to sit on hold anymore. From a savings perspective, an organization will look at an attended bot like that and say, shaving off a minute on every call, and we've got millions of calls a year, that's real money. Right? Then, of course, from an end user perspective, you've just made their day a lot better because they're not spending their time doing something over and over again that's unpleasant. The unintended bot uh, is where you've got a back office application. So you've got something that runs quietly in the background. Think about that Python script that runs off of cron at midnight. That's, that's an unattended bot, right? Uh, that's where you've got something that says, hey, look, at the end of the day, we need to go and reconcile all their uh, accounts go run that process for us. Uh, I don't want a human to have to kick this off. I don't want to see, I just want to see the results in my inbox the next morning. Unattended takes care of that all nicely. Uh, in a attended bot, it becomes really helpful when you're able to run this without admin privs. And so uh, being able to run an attended bot without admin privs means that you could have a user that has constrained access on that machine. This is especially helpful in a call center context where they're able to go and still run the bots and have the benefit of that kind of environment. How are we doing for time? Okay. So at this point, um, I could ask another question from Keith. Uh, he's now wondering, and which is fair enough, obviously, mm -hmm. that all these systems then integrate with some backend systems. Now, when those systems were designed for a company um, and this in environment wasn't in place, it, they were designed with a particular loading in mind that humans will be interacting with them. Now they are bots, mm -hmm. and they could be working very fast and accessing them quite quickly. So, is there a toggle? Is there a trigger um, or throttle? Sorry, in there that then moderates that traffic going to those systems. Uh, so you don't moderate the traffic going to the systems. You moderate the rate at which you interact with the application. And so you're able to go and say, you know, well, I need to insert a delay. This, this goes back to the think time conversation from earlier. Uh, I'm going to, you know. Uh, click OK, and I'm going to wait. And I'm going to wait for something to come back, or I'm going to have a delay of some amount of time or something like that. And that allows you to let your application go through its think time and moderate the rate at which you're interacting with it. Uh, there are times when you want to go and push that fast uh, because the backend can either handle it, the application can handle it, and so on. There are times when you go, no, wait, that's going to cause an adverse effect. I don't want to do that. There's a, a bit of human intelligence in the bot creation process that you need to put into that and some thinking through. Uh, this also tends to affect whether bot reliability. If you keep typing blindly as fast as you possibly can, then, and the system's not coming back fast enough, invariably the things that the bot is looking for as output aren't going to show up because the the application you're interacting with errored out or didn't do what you expected it to do. Uh, anyone who's used VB script and used that to do a send keys uh, has seen this before, right? If you send keys too fast into IE, it doesn't tab forward the way you expect it to, and suddenly, you know, it's completely lost in, in what's happening. This is not different in that regard. I'd like to make a similar question. Uh, from another point of view, um, are you considering or already working in cooperation with major software vendors or SaaS providers like, I don't know, SAP, Salesforce, to help them optimize their applications to work better with bots, to, be, to, to make them better compliant, bot ready? So we have relationships with all of these organizations, uh, all of these ISVs, uh, the usual suspects and so on. Uh, we've announced some of them and, and you know, all good stuff. Uh, the, the future for all of them is APIs. I mean, that, that's where everyone should be going to. Uh, if you get to an API, that addresses that exact use case, right? Uh, and that's fundamentally meant for that automation, using it with bots, et cetera. The challenge that they run into uh, is, is a couple of things. 
One is that at times they're, you know, this comes up with SaaS companies a lot. They're dealing with applications that still live on prem. And so they're, they, they need to interact with something and RPA becomes a great binding agent for pulling that together. Uh, an example of something like this, uh, uh, one of the, the SaaS providers out there needed to have a point where it jumped from the SaaS application to a 3270 application um, and it went and needed to enter a bunch of data, take the output and bring it back to the SaaS application. So just being able to do that interaction for them without them having to custom write or change the SaaS app in a manner that would be really unique to that one customer's environment was a, a huge godsend for them. Um, the, uh, uh, the other time that comes up is when they are dealing with things like data transfer. You're trying to pull something from a legacy system, put it into the SaaS application, uh, that kind of thing. So that bi-directional communication, it comes up a lot. Uh, and then there are times when, as a SaaS vendor, you look at this and you say, or, or just a modern ISV in general, how much investment do I want to put into building automations into my software when that's not my core business? My core business is understanding the workflows of my customers and providing them the tools for being able to do tax accounting or something like that. So am I better off partnering with some, you know, providing APIs or, or partnering with somebody to make sure that the bots reliably work in my environment. Um, that's another direction that we see the markets going in. But that could be a synergic <coughs> cooperation Correct. between you and, and the SaaS or the software vendor because by uh, improving the SaaS application with hooks that connect natively directly with RPA uh, vendors like you, they can extend the possible use cases Absolutely. and capabilities of the platform. So it's a win-win situation. Uh, it definitely. You know, when we engage with ISVs and SaaS vendors, uh, there's not resistance. Uh, usually there's an embrace. They, they understand the use cases. Uh, they are often coming into the conversations well-educated, uh, and they, they're usually coming in with specific things that they're trying to solve that don't make business sense for them to solve. And partnering with us becomes a, a, an avenue for them to be able to achieve that. And from our point of view, the better the tools are for automating a lot of these applications, and the stronger the tools are, the better it is for our customers. So that cloud service I talked about earlier. Um, so the joys of being in Silicon Valley is standing in line in Starbucks and overhearing like half a dozen nerd conversations. Um, there are billboards on 101 that have code on them and recommending, hey, if you can solve this code problem, please apply, right? Silicon Valley is a very unique place. And as much as I love Silicon Valley and as, as exciting as it is, and as nerdy as it is, um, the problem with it is that we have a tendency to do things like say, well, cloud first, right, as a design architecture. So as an engineering team, cloud first, and I'm sure you've all heard people like me say that before. It's cloud first, design first, something like that. The problem with both is that I think it's misreading what's happening in the world today. It's not about cloud. Cloud is assumed. It's about privacy. And so doing privacy first design changes the rules and it changes the way you think about a problem. So simple situation here. I've got a bot that's gonna go and access Workday and it's accessing HR records, right? This is sensitive stuff, people's payrolls, healthcare data, there's HIPAA issues involved. This is a circumstance where I want whatever that bot to see to stay within that bot and be ephemeral. The moment that bot's done, I want it to go away because the bot should have no memory. I don't want the control room to take a memory of it. I don't want a copy of it. I don't want it leaving the Workday system because that's where it belongs. In something like that, privacy trumps everything. So when we suddenly say we're bringing in a cloud environment, that's obviously the antithesis of privacy, uh, or at least that's how it tends to be perceived. So Making sure that we've got privacy first design was key to how we thought about the problem. First order of business was the bots run where the apps are. So I, I mentioned on-prem here, 
yeah, they can be on-prem, but they can also be in AWS, they can be in a private cloud, they can be wherever you need them to be. Wherever the app is, you run the bot, right? Um, we actually do see a fair number of requests for bots that run on-premise as well as on uh, what's happening with uh, uh, public cloud uh, and then some amount of uh, you know, additional cloud creativity that comes around. But by and large, the fact that you can have the choice in that becomes a big deal. Number two, a bot will only send data to control room if you tell it to. If the bot is not told to send data to control room, it will not. So aside from control data, aside from the data that the administrator needs from a controls perspective, everything stays private. Uh, we also go and make sure that control room only keeps operational data in its memory. So things like schedules, RBAC policies, stuff like that. That's the only thing you want there. Uh, stuff where if in the worst case it gets compromised, you're still never risking. You're not having to go and send a letter to all of your customers saying, sorry about that, we lost your credit card number again, right? You never want to have be in that position. And this is something that we really thought through early on. This means that you know all the regulatory stuff, the usual suspects, SOC 2 is going through, blah, blah, blah. That, that needs to be in place for you know, a healthy cloud environment is all there. Uh, and then we're also thinking a lot about that encrypted access. So you know, the, the latest and greatest in TLS, uh, TLS 1.2 is up there, you know, figuring out how does TLS 1.3 affect us, uh, how do we take advantage of some of the new capabilities of TLS 3, um, you know, zero RTT still makes me nervous, but I think it's a cool thing. That kind of thing can, can come up into that conversation and making sure that we've got modern uh, ciphers. So ECC, ECDHE, all that usual stuff that needs to go into a well-encrypted system are applied here. Uh, we also brought in a head of engineering that came from a VPN background to help us build the operational stack for this. So, you know, what's the WAF look like? What's the uh, remote access look like? What does all of the scaling infrastructure look like? What do all the security tiers look like in order to make sure that we're applying good discipline here? And how do you go and, you know, I don't like using the term, but how do you idiot proof it? Right. How do we make sure that Joe Random from one of our teams, because we have a growing team, doesn't sue do one night and do something that he shouldn't do? Right. Uh, that kind of discipline is being put into place. So a uh, lot of effort, a lot of thought put into that, and, and a lot of putting that up front before we get to the features. So as a cultural statement, that's where our head's at right now. Just a point of clarification. Mm -hmm. the Cloud service is an option. You don't have to run your control room as a cloud service. Correct. You can, if I want to keep control of that in my on-prem, I can run all of those elements. There, there's a, a lot of organizations where, due to regulatory concerns, um, you know, there was a use case that came up where they said, yeah, and you're not going to have internet access either, right? Uh, why? Because the internet is in a place that's scary relative to where our users are and our users are in life-threatening situations. Sorry, don't even start the cloud conversation and, you know, figure out how this thing runs 100% independent and we're figuring out a process for dealing with updates. So uh, there's a degree of sensitivity that comes up in a lot of use cases that, that mandate that. Um, I'm hopeful, I'm optimistic that uh, over the course of the next few years, a lot of the regulations get cleared up about these points. So people do know when they can use the cloud and we can start minimizing those situations. But there's still a lot of work to be done. Uh, and I think the, the surge in concern with privacy, rightfully so, uh, means that I think there's going to need to be a lot more work put into not only where the stance of security is, but also where clarity in terms of where the regulations are with respect to cloud. Uh, so there's work to be done. And we've got a cloud service here. This is your software installed inside my EC2 instance, my, my Azure. Yeah, so uh, my, my separation of cloud, non-cloud is actually, am I responsible for ops or are you responsible for ops? If you're responsible for ops, it's on-prem to me, right? The fact that you happen to run it in Azure, AWS, IBM Cloud, whatever, that's your choice. Uh, but that's your operational responsibility. Uh, the software does run in all the usual suspects, 
But then you're implying that there's also a software as a service model where you're responsible. I uh, there is a SaaS model where I, I hold the operational keys. You it ain't on you call me and I'm in you know I respond to you with an SLA. Is there another question? Okay. No. Okay. Uh, the controls. We we started on this earlier, and uh, uh, we uh, I want to just I think we've covered a lot of this already, so uh, I won't get into too much detail here. But the gist of it is this: you don't get to send anything to the bot runner until it's gone through control room. Then the rules. Uh, this was done specifically because we did not want a circumstance where you can get a road rogue bot that goes and does things out of sight of the administrator. Uh, bots can do things quickly and they can do damage quickly. So if you write a bad bot with the intent to do malicious stuff, we wanted to make sure that that didn't get out and, and start running all willy-nilly. By putting the controls in place, we have a way of being able to see who ran what under what circumstance, what time, where did it run, under what identity, et cetera. Right? So an example of the level of detail that gets captured here, every bot is dealing with three different identities. There's the identity that you have on the host operating system, so the Windows machine that you're on. There is the identity that the bot runs with with respect to control room. Uh, in an ideal world, you want those two to match up, but they don't always do because, hey, that's just, you know, hey, welcome to the enterprise. And then there's the third identity that is logging into the application itself. Again, in an ideal world, that's the same identity, but doesn't always happen. So being able to track those three identities and making sure that the audit trail captures all of those three identities becomes a critical part of it. Because if somebody comes around six months later and says, hey, we're doing a SOX check and by the way, we saw this transaction, it was a little squirrely, we found out a bot was doing it, you know, tell me that you've got this. The fact that you can go and replay all of the intimate detail, every step that the bot took, who, who ran it, when did it run, how was it scheduled, uh, what identities did it go with, means that you can provide a level of detail that comes out of the bot that doesn't normally come out of human transactions. So there's a visibility that you get from a regulatory compliance with bots that is really amazing and, and has high potential here. Making sure that you capture all of that becomes a critical part of how we think about it. If, a quick question. Um, would you say this falls under the same traditional CI, CD, version control type of thing? Uh, I'll be talking about version control in just a minute, but the short answer is yes. Yeah. Uh, or ideally we want it to be yes, but you, you know, it, it it's not a, a leap to suddenly fall out of CICD and come back to the, the, the misery of, of waterfall. So, uh, it's a pretty slide. If you want to read all of the bullets, you're welcome to pause the video later and read them. Uh, they're riveting. Uh, you know, uh, despite how exciting they are, I wanted to stick to just a few highlights here. Number one. Uh, we do do static code analysis. We publish the output of our static code analysis. So you want to find out how we did, you know, what are we running, what are our risks. You can always take any build, you can download that, and you can see what's there. We also do a static code analysis with um, uh, being able to go and see all of the open source components that we use. Uh, so you can see the security status of all of those as well. So uh, we want to be transparent with this process and make it as clean and visible as possible. Uh, we also are thinking about things like, you know, sometimes you want a bot to run and you don't want a human to interfere because the operator who's there should not be looking at it. So being able to do things like blanking out the screen, being able to go and disabling the mouse and keyboard so they can't suddenly inject key presses where they shouldn't, these sorts of things are actually baked into the architecture. Uh, the usual suspects of integrations, it ties into SAML, leverage a cyber arc, et cetera. All of those integrations are in place. So the question that was asked earlier, about, hey, what are the integrations with different security tools? Yeah, the, the, the things that you would expect to be integrated are there. So, you know, it knows and understands what an Active Directory's environment looks like. Um, there's improvements that we need to make in terms of handling multi multiple forests and things like that. Those are coming in short order. Um, this is what happens when you hire somebody who used to do VPNs for a living. The, uh, uh, you know, typing, tying into a lot of password management, uh, CyberArk is the premier one. We put a lot of focus on that. We have a close partnership with them, so we're excited by what's happening there. Uh, and then being able to go and tie into the you know, you know, Kerberos, and Kerberos environments and so on, and being a first-class citizen in that universe. Um, you know, 
basically all of the things that you would expect out of a, a traditional enterprise environment are present. Uh, so if you go look at our, our new customers, a lot of large financials that have really strict security policies have evaluated this, blessed it, and put it into their environment. So in terms of being able to play nice, what you would expect is there. Uh, we talked about this earlier from a firewall friendliness. How do you make sure that as an infrastructure piece it's working nicely? Uh, you can see all of the port numbers there that are exposed. Basically everything is a RESTful call. We keep all of our internal protocol messes from, from the old days uh, inside of us and all of that's turning into a series of microservices as well. So everything just becomes a series of API calls and we use our own internal load balancer for handling the traffic uh, for, as a sidecar process. So uh, very straightforward and of course everything uh, is also using web sockets for any time we need to stream data. So as long as you've got 443 and 890, 8090 open, you're in good shape. Uh, audit captures a tremendous amount of detail. Uh, we talked about some of the detail earlier in terms of what are the uh, tools that you put into it and what do you capture for identities. Uh, that extends out to also host-based information. That extends out to event-based information. Uh, this also goes to the management stack. Uh, are we capturing and recording all the things that happen on the management stack? <laughs> Uh, by tracking that management stack carefully, we're able to show that what are the changes from a configuration perspective uh, and come back and audit the control room itself. The bot identity is interesting. So what happens when you need a password for logging into an application? So the bot in some cases needs to replay a password. There's no getting around it because you're not using any kind of MFA solution there or it's a really old app. There is no MFA option. In those kinds of circumstances, you need a way of being able to store a password in a secure manner. What we can do with the, uh, 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 the tool for keeping our identities together, our, our, our locker for this, is that every uh, line of business can get its own private locker of identities. So with every locker of identity, you're able to go and see passwords in isolation. So now, one line of business can't see another line of businesses uh, passwords. So imagine for a moment you've got the HR team that's creating bots for automating some of their processes. Clearly, a VP of HR should never have their identity gone and seen by a bot developer. So having that clear rules-based access combined with the locker and isolation means that you had that protection. This also means that when a bot needs a password, it's able to just go and say, uh, during development time, I want to use a dummy account. But when it's runtime, the runtime, it'll go fetch the password, it'll keep it encrypted in memory, so you can't just go and do a dump of memory as a developer. It'll use the password and wipe it. And then at that point, as a developer, I can't go and see that password. I can't cut and paste it. I can't you know, go and dump it somewhere else. It does it as one step in one transaction, and so we're able to protect those different identities that the bot needs to impersonate in order to go and make certain transactions work. And that separation in the single locker becomes critical. So you apply roles-based access to everything. So every element in the system has our back. So one of the things that comes up is uh, how do you start separating the different lines of businesses? And there's this tendency to say, well, we should just do this with multi-tenancy. Um, the problem with multi-tenancy is when we go back to that infrastructure question, you're suddenly kind of spraying out your infrastructure and then you don't have a central view of what's happening. So if you need one person who has oversight over what's happening so they can answer questions like, from an audit perspective, are we going to meet what we need? If a SOX question comes in, we can answer it quickly because it's end of quarter, I got to get on a call with Wall Street and I got to explain something. All of those things often require having oversight. So our back with the granularity gives you that view within a single organization. Now, if you're talking about you are a reseller, you have multiple customers, that's a true multi-tenant need. We can solve that as well. Come talk to us, we'll, we'll help you go through that process. But for an organization that's just rolling this out and they've got different lines of businesses, don't overcomplicate the world. Use our back and, and get the, the tightness that you want with the granularity you want without the complexity of trying to separate different pieces of infrastructure. So the last piece are developers. Uh, developers are, are 
fun. So this is the part that I really enjoyed in the last build. One of the big steps we took was we said we wanted to make coding a bot be able to be seamless when it jumps into real programming versus when it comes out of it. And this is actually a tricky thing because you, you normally look at two different environments. What you invariably are dealing with are complex problems like how do you pass a variable from one environment to another without having to do anything complicated on setting up the stack frame? How do you go and get two languages to work with one another? How do you go and make a bot where the user may not be a programmer, be able to go and send things out to the right place? So what we did is we actually supported inline scripting you can actually run Python inside of a bot. And the way that plays out in terms of what the UI does is you can say, all right, you know, open up a Python script. Uh, here's the method I want to call. This is the parameter I want to call. And every time you want to call it, you just have, you drag and drop the request for calling that method past the uh, variable you want, and it's off and running. And the variables are bot variables. So as a bot developer, you're still speaking your language. You, you see all of the variables on the right side of the screen. It's very straightforward, easy to use. This allows you to give something like a Python script that uses the latest ML libraries. And you can put that in the hands of somebody who does not understand Python and say, it's inside of this little piece of, of bot code, just pass the right parameter and it will give you an output. So imagine for a moment that you were doing a risk analysis for mortgages, right? Exciting, I know. Uh, but it happens all the time. So you've got some Python code that has the smarts for doing the risk analysis. It, it goes and queries half a dozen different systems. It has the brains for doing it. All sorts of magic happens, and it pops out with a risk score, right? So you want to be able to pass a uh, account information into there and get a risk score on the other side. Your Python script can take care of the messy work in the middle, and you can use your data scientist for putting that together, but your data scientists now don't have to figure out how to interact with Excel, and they don't have to interact with Salesforce, and they don't have to interact with half a dozen other systems in order to make their script valuable. So the data scientist stays specialized in what they do, it inlines, and uh, the person who understands the business process stays specialized in what they do, and they can simply call the right methods and it just magically comes together. So the fact that you can inline this becomes really powerful. Uh, this also means that the latest and greatest in terms of ML libraries, which invariably come with Python bindings before they come without anything else, are available to you. So whenever somebody gets excited about, well, you know, we, we're working with Google and Google has the latest AI, well, yeah, because they're going and taking the open source and putting it up and, and adding their sauce to it. But if you want the latest research, this is where you're going. So, this is, gets really exciting, gets very powerful as well. And this also means that you can start getting, you go from bot developers, you can say, hey, you know, there's middle ground here for somebody who's a scripter. They're not a, a, a super duper star programmer. They just want to go and put together a couple of scripts. And, you know, who here hasn't put together a simple Python script for doing a simple thing? We, we stole it from the internet, cut and pasted it, made it work, and it, and it was fine. You don't have to write magic in here in order to get value. So this makes it a lot easier to do. Out the door, we've got VB script support, we've got Python support, and then uh, we've already got uh, JavaScript support in the lab that's working, that's really exciting. Um, You've got a lot of PowerShell people in the room, where's that on the roadmap? Uh, PowerShell is coming down the pipeline because once you can get VB script working, a lot of the framework for being able to support PowerShell is also there. Um, the fundamental block of saying, here's an external module that I want to call and a language that goes with it can get plugged into there. That's in place. Once I have that, it's a matter of bringing in another language, doing the work of, of embedding that correctly, and then making sure that you've got the um, method for passing parameters back and forth. So the bar, the incremental bar for supporting new languages now is a lot lower than when we started. Uh, so. PowerShell definitely is uh, one that is not the first time we've heard the request. Uh, we've also gotten a request for raw SQL. Um, mm. So being able to support raw SQL is definitely coming. So, so since we mentioned PowerShell, which is one of uh, the tools of trade of system, and, uh, system administrators, a uh, question comes spontaneous. Do you think that RPA in general and your solution specifically can be adapted or can be used also to 
automate the work of IT operation people, system administrators. Uh, see, now you're speaking to my heart, man. Uh, yes, uh, and I say that for you know with passion. Um, look, there's there's what I describe as the CNE problem, right? Uh, there's a whole generation of sysadmins that grew up without a computer science degree. They went and did certifications, right? Certified Novell engineers, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right? You got certified Novell engineers out there. You got the Red Hat engineers, Microsoft, blah, 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 right? Um, so if you've gone and spent your career building up these certifications, and now, you know, some clown like me shows up and says, hey, we got APIs, and you're going to learn Python, and it's going to be awesome. You're going to get glazed eyes. Because at this point, you're middle of your career, right? You've got a mortgage, you've got kids, you've got soccer practice on Saturday. Right? And let's be real, sysadmins aren't just nerdy geeks playing video games all the day, all day. They've got families and personal obligations. So learning a whole new programming language and a whole new way of doing DevOps, as exciting as it is, it is the future, and, and it's something I still encourage everyone to learn and do is not something that is always available or is always available in the time frame we want it to be. So you're still under the gun for getting things done faster and more efficiently because that's where the pressure's coming from. Do more with less, we've all heard this. But being able to go and say, you know what, I don't need to be a superstar in order to get some automations working. RPA will help you with that. Uh, this will also help you with the stuff that doesn't have APIs, right? Um, I was sharing a story earlier about the, the, the great BGP outage on the CAT 6500 from a couple years back where Cisco went and changed the CLI on the, the CAT 6500 for BGP and all the expect scripts broke, broke, right? You know, and everyone came back and said, well, yeah, you shouldn't be writing expect scripts, you should be using APIs. Well, we were writing expect scripts because at that time, CAT 6500s didn't have APIs. Uh, they've since added a handful of APIs, but it's no AC, you know, ACI solution. So, uh, and there's still a ton of that kind of legacy infrastructure out there. There's old stuff, they don't have APIs, they're not gonna get APIs and we're still gonna have to deal with them. RPA is great for stuff like that because I can go and I can get stuff scripted for that and I can get them to work. If they've got some old GUI, that's my only choice because they didn't give a command line because you know, that's how they was designed. I can still do that and I can make it work. I need to SSH into something and write a simple expect script. I can make a bot do that. Um, I can even automate old mainframes with 3270, right? You know, JCL for the win. Um, this is stuff that, that you can do with RPA. So from an ITSM perspective, right? How do I go and, and pull this in? How do I tie it into my service now ticketing stuff? Right. This is all stuff that you can automate. And if you don't want to be a Python superstar today, but you want to get some value, RPA can definitely help you. And AI and machine learning can help a lot. AI ops is, is the next big thing. Because and what, what we do is not something that is predictable or repetitive, but it does a certain degree of randomness and flexibility and adaptability. So there must be something to help us uh, handle these corner cases and... So think about, um, there's there's a bunch of AI op stuff uh, out there uh, that's emerging that's really exciting, yeah. right? All of them have these cool APIs. So they're monitoring all of this, this uh, especially in security, they're monitoring your, your data center infrastructure. They're coming up with all of these reports and you want to be able to go and take the assertions it's making and tie it back to the legacy switch that it's reporting on because it's looking at the SNMP data and it's seeing that, hey, there's a spike here I don't like, right? If you want to go and turn off that port, RPA can talk to that API on one side and then log into that switch on the other side and still be able to turn off that port. So being able to stitch together AI ops with the rest of the world is, is very much there. If you want to go and you know, there's that one person on the team that, that does speak Python, can you Spark ML and all the new tools that are coming out from an ML perspective? Great, let them inline some Python and the rest of the team can use that, that bot and be able to go and stitch together AI uh, ops works flows that have the smarts of it without needing everyone to be a, a, a Python superstar. So, so yeah, CNEs, man, they, ruled, they used to rule the world. <laughs> so, um, we, we've talked about that. Uh, 
this means that the CI/CD question, uh, I didn't forget, uh, comes up because now you want to be able to do bot lifecycle management, being able to go and manage the control room and tying together all of the uh, pieces becomes really key. Uh, so you want dev, test, and prod. We can support all of these things. I want to import a bot, export a bot, uh, run it on the next system, separate the universes. I don't want the policies from dev to come to test, et cetera. Uh, the example from earlier that Abhijit shared about the center of excellence, the COE. Uh, oftentimes, COEs are the oversight, overseers of this environment because a COE isn't just technical teams. It's also things like some of the line of business owners. There's an audit person involved. There's a security person involved. Uh, there's the IT person involved. So all of the roles that need to be involved in order to say, I have a bot and I agree that this bot is going to do the right thing. It's auditable. It'll pass socks, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to promote it to test. The COE team can help navigate that. But not all the organization have the resources or the size to have an internal CO, COE team to develop bots or you know organize the uh, restructure of the organization. It might just be the RPA admin, right? It's more of the principle of I don't want bots going into production until we've done some sanity on this. So sanity just might be the RPA admin sitting down with the bot developer and saying, okay, show me what you did and let's make sure that you're not logging. If you're logging into a critical piece of infrastructure and you're gonna make a big change or an automated change, let's sanity check that what you're doing isn't gonna go and create a bunch of bad data, right? Uh, it's, it's the discipline of checking your work before you promote it into production. Is this something that is <clears throat> default to the platform? A lot of times when stuff gets deployed, it gets deployed at default. And sometimes they go, ooh, in order to make it faster, we're going to turn off, you know, this sanity check type of, you know, thing and go, well, we'll just deploy it and then we'll come back and, and check it later. Is that something, is the default to say, you know what, we're going to make sure that everybody, all of these bots? No, it does not enforce that because there are circumstances where uh, there are reasons why somebody doesn't want to have this in that environment or they've completely separated the environment and they have an end-to-end -end system in their dev that they want to mimic that whole behavior without actually putting controls in place. Um, so it does not mandate it, no. Uh, the way that I see administrators mandate it uh, is they, they separate out test and prod. So you can't promote things into test and prod without having a, a person validate what your work is. And that's great if you have that type of environment, but I mean, there's a common you know, meme or joke within the IT community that you know, everybody has a test environment, you know, and some people actually have it separate from their production environment. But it's not, <laughs> you know, I mean, we test in production, we do all this other stuff. So it just, I think a lot of our concern is around the idea that without having some sort of check and balance, you could easily have somebody who means well within your environment deploy a bot that can then go do a massive you know denial of service attack from the inside because they don't know and understand exactly oh i wrote this command that says i want to go ping every server that we have you know a thousand times a second and and we're just going to deploy this thing and, and to make sure that all of our servers are up right they don't realize that it's not you know I want to ping it a thousand times and they don't realize it's in a second and all of a sudden all of your systems go down because somebody deployed a ping bot. It seems, you know. I like the idea. So, so I think this is really interesting and, and you're raising an a perspective that I, I had not considered. Um, I tell you what, you send me one of those memes, uh, especially if it's a good funny one and, and I will put this, uh, I will personally get involved with putting together that epic. I got it for you in a minute. <laughs> I look at this, and my next logical question is, can you write a bot to manage the bot life cycle management? We've had people <laughs> do that. Um, Inception for bots? I, but what, I, what I'm hearing is that if I provided better oversight and tooling, then I wouldn't have to subject people to building their own automation stack in order to use the automation stack. You already have an AI that could learn what I would authorize. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> sometimes you do want adult supervision. I always want adult mm. supervision. Is there one in the room? <laughs> uh, so we're going to uh, part with this, and that is um, uh, you know, the environment that we're also creating for 
for developers is, is we're making it developer friendly. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, being able to see, say, you know, a workflow right next to code becomes really straightforward. Uh, the usual things that you would expect in terms of debugging tools, version control management, uh, the bot lifecycle management, uh, these are all things that are baked into the product. Uh, you know, being able to go and do diffs against bots and see what's changing from what to what, um, because normal diff tools don't work. If you just take user bin diff and try to diff to JSON files, you're gonna get a mess of stuff back. Doesn't mean anything to a business user, may not mean anything to a developer, uh, so we have our own diff that helps you do that. So a lot of those developer tools that you would want to be present in an environment like this are present. I really love the fact that we can do the inline scripting without linking. Uh, that's, that's a big deal because anyone who's tried to write Python code calling you know, C code or Java code or something like that has seen the misery of setting up the, the stack uh, to pass a parameter. The fact that I don't have to do that and I get to use these, these fun tools becomes really nice uh, and the virtual variable passing that comes with it. 